The recent truck driver strike embarked on by Sitau has weighed heavily on the valuations of logistics companies like Imperial and Barlow's. But the acquisition by Imperial of logistics uh, business in Europe, uh, Lenkering, will contribute as much as 15% to its operating profits and looks set to transform Imperial from a RAND strength stock to a RAND hedge stock. Here to discuss his view on the industrial counters ranging from Imperial and Barlow's to Bidvest is Anishwin Bilay. He's from Stanlip. Welcome. Very good to have you okay, here. Thanks. So Warren selected this grouping, which, which I think is a rather interesting one. And I just want to start off by asking you, in diversified industrial companies such as these three, do you approach them differently? Because they, they almost approach uh, investment holding companies, but they aren't because management yeah. is, is fairly involved. Mm -hmm. Do you factor in a management's ability and success at allocating capital within the various subgroupings? Yes, I think that's quite important, especially with these large counters. Uh, I mean, for example, I mean, that's why we kind of like a Bidvest and an Imperial uh, because they got they good ca capital allocators and also they're, they, you can see it in their returns as well. I mean, Bidvest is uh, return on equity is above 20% and so is Imperial. So an Imperial tends to favor asset light kind of acquisitions which obviously enhance return on uh, invested capital and also return on equity as well. So yeah, I think it's quite important and obviously it helps with uh, then obviously going for the cash flows and uh, the balance sheet of the business. So mm -hmm. yeah, we, we tend to favor stocks like that. And generally speaking, these have been fairly acquisitive companies, Imperial in particular and Bidvest in particular, historically speaking. So a good track record so far. Yes, uh, especially in Bidvest case, I mean obviously they've had one or two companies that haven't gone well, but in the, in the main, I mean, they've delivered quite uh, decent compound annual growth over a long period of time. And as I said, I mean, consistent return on equity through the cycle, and that kind of shows through in terms of the acquisition strategy. Imperial has been initially 08, 07, they had disposed a lot of businesses, a lot of cyclical businesses. And thereafter, I mean, they've done some good acquisitions recently, Linkering being one of them. I mean, just to give you an idea of size, I mean, it's about 584, Million, um, million euros, so it's quite a large business, and uh, obviously they're bedding that down, down quite well. And then the latest acquisition was they announced was RTT, so they're obviously linking into their strategy of going into Africa, following their clients. Uh, that's also been looks like quite a good acquisition. I mean, it's roughly to give you a size, 1.1 billion rand turnover, and obviously gets them into the space of. Uh, pharma and healthcare products and distributing that into Africa. And Ashwin, I asked you before the show whether Imperial, uh, whether this linkering acquisition f was, was the first uh, for Imperial in Europe and you indicated that they had bought other companies. Yeah. Just in terms of w where do you think Imperial, what, Im what is Imperial going to look like in five years based on uh, these recent acquisitions? Because we alluded to uh, in the intro that it, it's regarded as a RAND uh, strength stock it may become a RAND hedge stock. If you could just explain that uh, yeah. for, for viewers. I think, that, I think the thinking is obviously they want to expand on their logistics footprint, especially in Africa. And that's, in t uh, that's also in some sense uh, dollar denominated that they earn their, 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 their revenue and uh, operating profit in, which helps with CIC that they requ uh, also acquired. And I mean, essentially it looks like they obviously want to try and diversify their income streams into more annuity type streams. So, for example, move away from just new car sales, which are obviously highly cyclical. Obviously, it's doing quite well at the moment, but we know, I mean, as interest rates go up, that could start impacting new vehicle sales, et cetera, et cetera. So, what they're trying to do is, with the, the, the business is moving to annuity income stream, so from maintenance, service products, et cetera, et cetera. And with the, with the growth in the vehicle car park from Hyundai and Kia, I mean, it's roughly at about 700,000 cars on aggregate now over the last few years. So they've grown that quite a lot. It, it lends itself to more annuity income streams. And then also they're building on this African footprint, so increasing their logistics footprint. So obviously trying to get away from that very cyclical type business. So in, in a few years time, we could see an imperial with a, with a, with a larger logistics footprint. And obviously, I mean, they're looking at financial services and other things to try and offset that cyclical portion of their business. The, the distribution that you mentioned there of Hyundai has been a great, uh, a great brand to own for, for a, a company that, that uh, generates its revenue selling, selling motor cars in South Africa. Just in terms of the Lenkering acquisition, and we talk about this, ap this uh, allocation of capital quite often on the show. How did you fare in terms of the price they paid for that acquisition? Was it was it a fair price to pay for I that think business? It, it, I think it was a fair price to pay. Obviously, at the time when they did it, Europe was in a lot of trouble and people were concerned about the performance and the stock gone down to below 
uh, like almost uh, below 100 rand, so it got down to like 96 rand. So people were concerned about that. But Linkering produced a quite a good performance first half, and they have, uh, in terms of their their split, I mean, quite a large portion is fertilizer and chemicals, which is quite de defensive, and also based in Germany, the German economy is seeming to hold up quite well. So. I mean, in terms of the multiple, the funding was quite good. So obviously, it wa on, the, on balance, I thought it was quite a good acquisition. Just in terms of the capital allocation, you know, we talk about the, the, the uh, acquisition strategy and skills of Brian Joffe and uh, what he's done with Bidvest. Uh, he's probably bought, I'm sure, hundreds of companies uh, during his tenure as, as the CEO and obviously the founder of the company. But just in terms of uh, Bidvest's um, current strategy, we talked a little bit off air around this incredible food services business that the company owns and the ways that uh, Brian has thought about trying to unlock value for shareholders. Could you just give us a bit of an update and some insight on what you thought around uh, what's been happening after they received that uh, offer to buy the, the food services business? Okay, if we can just take a step back first, I think it's important to note, I mean, for us, Bidvest is quite a, is quite a pure currency play, so, I mean, 49% of their revenue is coming from foreign currency and about 27% of their operating profit, so it's quite a large portion coming from uh, non-RAND kind of currencies. And then in terms of uh, the, the food service business, uh, it's, it's the only e emerging market food service business in the, in the world. So unlike Cisco and US Food Services and uh, Breaks, which is, operates in the UK, I mean, it's quite a unique business and our people obviously want to get their hands on it. Also, in terms of their expansion plans, I mean, China seems to be featured quite good in the Asia Pacific uh, portion of the business, which is still dominated a little bit by Australia, which is about 60% of that business. And they're looking to roll that out into second tier cities and things like that. So there's a big opportunity there. Also, they're looking at Chile and LATAM as well, which could present good opportunities for them. It's quite a fragmented market there, but obviously with the World Cup coming up and obviously the GDP growth in Brazil and things like that, they could obviously benefit a lot from that. So our I, I think coming back to the your initial question, I mean, I think they, they could have sold this business uh, a year or so ago, but I think the question is, could they unlock more value in years to come? And I think that's kind of what, what I'm thinking. I mean, they could expand this business uh, quite a lot. And I mean, given that their balance sheet is quite strong, I mean, they could put capital in. I think it will be a great asset to, for, for shareholders in years to come. Mm. Warren might have more questions on that, but if I could just ask you, and if, if you were to contrast, say, Bidvest and Imperial, um, the, the obvious difference is uh, Brian Joffe's more entrepreneurial approach, allowing the, the managers of the various businesses to do it their way, whereas Imperial, I'd imagine, is far more, uh, far more operational involvement from top management. Is that, is that a benefit for Bidvest? Yes, I think uh, I think th that comes in with a with a sense that at some stage Brian Joffrey will step down. So the so the underlying managers, Lindsay Riles, who runs the South African business, you saw it in the last results, produced an exceptional result, and I think you'll see some of those cost benefits coming through again with some quite good gearing coming through in the operations. And then Bernard Burson, who runs the 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 food service business, he's also done quite well. So. The underlying managers in Bidvest are, uh, as you say, I mean, are, are, are top class. I mean, I think that's the only way to put it. So even if the, the, the top level management step down, there's always people to take over. So the succession is there. Uh, and that's quite important, as you might know, for a business that that's that, that big. On the Imperial side, I think Hubert's done quite a good job as well. Hubert Brody, I think he's good capital allocator. He's chose asset light businesses, and they kind of live that throughout their operations whether it be it logistics, be it um, in the AMH business, wherever it is, they, they talk return. So I think from that point of view, I mean, they, they're different, but I mean, it, uh, at the end of the day, they, you know that the shareholders are most important to them. So they, they, they're driving shareholder returns. So for us, that's quite important. Mm. And just at this point in time, you indicated to us uh, that, that you're overweight or you recommend an overweight uh, weighting for both these companies. So j just in terms of the valuation, at this point, what are your thoughts for investors thinking about picking up these shares? Yeah, I mean, with the obvious weakness uh, recently in, the, in both those share prices, I mean, Bidvest, just to give you some ideas, trading on roughly a 13 and a half times multiple, and that compares to 18 of the industrial index. So, I mean, it's relatively cheap. It's got a 20% return on equity, coupled with a 3% dividend yield. Uh, and we expect that to, to be better in the coming year. So, I mean, from that point of view, the valuation stacks up well. Same with Imperial. I mean, it's trading on a historic of about 11 times now, uh, and also a 4% yield. Also, good cash generation, good management. I mean, and the, the ROEs are just above 20% as well. 
So it looks quite attractive from a valuation point of view. So some scope there for, for investors to have a look at. But just in terms of one of the other companies that we mentioned uh, is, is uh, Barlow, Barlow World. Yes. Uh, you're a little bit concerned about uh, the MS. Well, they sell a lot of their uh, a lot of their business comes from selling equipment to the mining industry. W what's your thoughts on where the mining in industry is at at the moment? Yeah, the, the the mining industry is under a little bit of pressure. Hence, mining capex is coming under pressure. And Barlow World, basically, 50% of their operating profit comes from the equipment business. And with mining capex coming up, obviously the, the contract miners and, and such are basically cutting down on their purchases of equipment. So that's going to impact them. It basically impacts Barlow World's order book and obviously their forward revenue. So the market kind of anticipates that to happen. And you've see it, seen it in the share price as well. It's pulled back. I mean, at one stage, Barlow World, a couple of months back, was at, a, at 100 Rand. So it's pulled back to below 70 Rand or just about 70 Rand. So, uh, it's, it's tricky in the sense that there's quite a bit of forecast risk there and obviously with the mining climate and things not being as uh, good China slowdown etc cetera, etc cetera, I mean it's, we are a little bit cautious on Barlow's and obviously they've apart from that they've got a quite a big motor exposure as well so quite a bit of their revenue comes from the from motor dealerships and stuff like that so if there is a, a slowdown there as well then they get a double whammy so we are a little bit that's why and we are a little bit cautious on that one What's your feeling on foreign interest in this particular sector? We know in the retail sector, for instance, a huge presence, particularly in some stocks and in the finan financial sector, that's gradually picking up. Is there an appetite for these diversified there industrial stocks? There definitely is. I mean, uh, I think that's that's uh, definitely been the case over the over the last little while. To give you some sense, I mean, Barlow World, for example, is quite popular with the foreigners. I mean, the foreign ownership is nearly 50% now. Uh, Bitvest has moved up dramatically. I mean, at one stage there was little or no foreign interest because they thought it was a complex co conglomerate and no one was interested. But they could obviously see with uh, with Fitch and Moody's upgrading their their corporate bond status and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, balance sheet strong, uh, decent management etc. And it's it's become quite popular and that foreign ownership has moved up quite a lot. And the same with Imperial. I mean, people like it a lot. Uh, they like the, the Africa story as what they do with most stocks. And yeah, I mean, that's also that foreign ownership has moved up quite a lot as well. So definitely uh, a place to play for the foreigners. You've indicated, Anishin, that, that just uh, off air as well, that uh, Bala World in particular would be looking at disposing of some of its assets. Do you, could, you st could you specify which ones they are talking about? Yes. I mean, basically, their, their thinking is to d dispose of underperforming assets. So they have done of US handling and UK handling, which hasn't performed very well. But I mean, they, you could see some other underperforming businesses also going. I mean, the speculation is that uh, the, maybe the Australian dealership business might also go. And that might basically use the, put the cash to better use in their, in their equipment business. I mean, uh, that's basically the thinking.